So in this next module, I'm going to go through another example and use it to kind of lead into giving you an overview of a couple of principles of effective writing that I'll be talking about this week as well as next week. So here's another example that I pulled out of Cell, which of course is the top biology journal. It has an impact factor of something like 32. So uh, again, this is uh, really representative of the kinds of things you read in the literature. So it says, dysregulation of physiologic microRNA, MIR, activity has been shown to play an important role in tumor initiation and progression, including gliomogenesis. Therefore, molecular species that can regulate MIR activity on their target RNAs without affecting the expression of relevant mature MIRs may play equally relevant roles in cancer. So again, as I'm reading through this, I'm struggling to get through it. I'm struggling to figure out exactly what it is that the authors were intending to say. So for this example, I'm going to point out some very specific features that make these two sentences difficult to read. So first, as in the examples we saw earlier, there's the use of nouns rather than verbs. So the authors use dysregulation, initiation, progression, and expression. Those are all nouns that could have been verbs. Dysregulate, initiate, progress, and express. Verbs really move the sentences along, whereas nouns kind of slow the reader down. The authors also here use some vague words. The problem with using words that are really vague is that the reader cannot get a concrete picture in their head of what the author is talking about. So those vague words don't really add anything. So for example, the word physiologic here. Well, physiology is something that's really, really broad, so I'm not exactly sure what the authors mean by physiologic. It doesn't really add much for me. And then we get down to molecular species. Well, molecular species could be a lot of things. And so again, by saying something so vague, it's hard for me to form a concrete picture in my head of what the authors are talking about. Note the use also of unnecessary jargon and acronyms in, in this little passage. So uh, we get the word gliomogenesis, for example. Well, that's kind of a fancy word. We can probably say that in a little bit of a simpler way. Again, if you're writing for a wide audience, you don't want to write things in too technical uh, of uh, terms. So also note the use of unnecessary jargon and acronyms in this passage. So we get the term gliomogenesis, which is just kind of a fancy way to say uh, the formation of glioma. There's easier ways and more direct ways to say that. We also get um, kind of an interesting acronym in this example. The acronym is actually the reason that I happen to pick this particular example. So the authors abbreviate the term microRNA as MIR. It's a little bit amusing, right, because RNA is already itself an acronym, so the authors have made an acronym of an acronym. And this really is just uh, showing you something that's really widespread out in the scientific literature. Authors love to use acronyms. They throw them all over the place. The problem with acronyms is that unless they're things that are really, really standard that everybody is familiar with, most readers aren't going to know your acronym, especially if you've just made it up, which many authors do. So when they get to your acronym in the piece they're reading, they're going to have to stop and pause and figure out, oh, what was, what is MIR? They have to go back and look it up, and that's going to halt them, that's going to stop them and slow their reading. It's really, really hard on the reader. It's Right for the author because it saves them the time of having to write the whole word out every uh, instance. Um, but it's really, really, really hard on the reader. So I'm going to encourage you to avoid the use of acronyms uh, for everything except the most standard acronyms that are out there. So really get in the habit of trying to decondition yourself from using so many acronyms. You can see that in this case, there's really no benefit to using the acronym. So. Uh, Instead of saying, you know, you're only saving a couple of letters here by using MIR rather than microRNA. And when I get to that second sentence and I see, you know, molecular species that can regulate MIR, I had to pause and actually think about what is MIR? So that really slowed the reading down for me. Another thing I want to point out is in this first sentence, the authors use what is called the passive voice for their verb tense. So um, they say, dysregulation of physiologic microRNA activity has been shown. Now I'm going to spend quite a bit of time next week talking about the difference between the active and the passive voice. So if this is the first time you're hearing about it or you're not that comfortable with what that is, we'll go into it in great detail next week. But for now, I'll just point out that that's one thing that makes that sentence kind of hard to read. 
because the English language, the way we normally talk, is we do subject, verb, object. The passive voice inverts that and goes object, verb, subject, or sometimes just object, verb. And it's a very awkward way. We would never talk in that way. So for example, if you take the sentence, she throws the ball, that's in the active voice. If you were to turn that in the passive, vo passive voice, you would say, the ball was thrown by her. And you can see that that sounds just very awkward. It makes the writing really hard to read. So next week, we'll talk a lot about trying to not use the passive voice. The second sentence of that passage is actually in the active voice, uh, but it has another problem with the verb. Uh, in this sentence, the subject of the sentence is molecular species. The main verb of that sentence is may play. But notice that we don't get to the main verb for a long time. We get molecular species, and then we get this whole descriptive clause, and then finally we get to the verb may play. Now the problem with this is that the reader is waiting for the verb. So until you give the reader the verb, the reader doesn't know where, the, where you're going with the sentence. And so that's really hard on the reader. So putting too much distance between the subject of the sentence and the main verb is a problem. We're also going to talk about that in great detail next week when we focus on verbs. So I took um, that passage and I rewrote it. Uh, kind of trying to fix some of these issues that I just pointed out to you. And I'll tell you, I did not have the author sitting right next to me while I was doing this edit, so I'm not 100% sure that I've completely um, represented what they were trying to say, but I think I, I've got the general idea. So uh, the rewrite says, changes in microRNA expression play a role in cancer, including glioma. Therefore, events that disrupt microRNAs from binding to their target RNAs may also promote cancer. And I think that's just a lot easier to understand. Uh, I fixed a lot of those issues that I uh, talked about earlier. And notice how much shorter that second sentence, uh, that second passage is uh, than the original. So this leads into giving you a little overview of some of the specific principles of effective writing that we're going to be talking about this week and next week. So the first one is I want you to learn to cut your words. Cut unnecessary words and phrases. Get rid of the clutter. We're going to spend the rest of this week talking about cutting clutter. Next week we'll talk uh, in great detail about the use of the active voice rather than the passive voice. And we'll also talk about writing with verbs, using strong verbs, avoiding turning verbs into noun, and not burying the main verb, keeping the subject and the main verb of the sentence close together at the beginning of the sentence. So we'll get to numbers two and three in great detail next week when we focus on verbs. This week we're going to focus on number one, learning to cut the clutter. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.